In the video today, we're answering a viewer question because Philip G asks us, what's the best way to fire two guns at once? <laughs> All right, Philip, what are you planning? <laughs> Jesus. And just before we get into that, thanks to Cuisine Royale for sponsoring this video, a multiplayer last man standing online shooter, which is free to play. Maybe you're already a pro at dual wielding and you're thinking, Simon, I know what I'm doing. Well, in that case, put yourself to the test with Cuisine Royale. It's a last man standing star game where basically you arrive on a map, you search out a whole bunch of stuff to kill people with, and then you proceed to kill them or be kills. We can't all be winners, can we? It's a lot of fun, realistic with, you know, normal guns and stuff that you'd expect from a game like this, but it's also pretty intensely crazy. There's different characters you can play with who have special abilities like bullet time, cloaking, or the power of the Norse gods. Yes, really, but that's just the start. Discover teleportation, work out how to summon zombies, use a jetpack, set some traps. Yes, this game, you might have guessed, is pretty insane. And these are all things that are there just to serve you so you can be the last person standing. Oh, and best of all, this game is totally free. It's easy to access. PC, Xbox One, PS4. Just download it and get started. It's a lot of fun for a cost of zero dollars. So give it a try, register below, and let's get into today's video. If you've ever seen pretty much any action movie involving a badass spy or member of law enforcement, you know a common trope in the industry is to have the protagonist firing away at the bad guys with a gun in both hands. But is this ever actually done in real life, and if so, what's considered the proper method for such badass looking weapon wielding? To begin with, there are indeed many accounts of people in history wielding two guns at once as a fighting tactic, despite it being decried by basically every firearms expert on the planet today. In fact, historically, matchlock pistols, among others, were often built and sold in pairs, with some even being specifically designed to be held in either the left or the right hand. As you might have guessed from this, there was a time when dual wielding was an excellent tactic to use, and in more modern times, there is even one group of soldiers who seem to have used it in actual combat and outline the most effective way to do it, which we'll get into shortly. First, going back to the early days of handguns, these weapons could only be fired once and then needed to be reloaded, which was a rather time-consuming process. They also often had a tendency to not fire at all. Thus, choosing to hold two of the guns at the same time allowed you to increase the odds of getting at least one shot off and, in the best case, allowed two shots without needing to take the time to draw a second weapon or reload. Not just for firing at multiple targets, this was a much better tactic for firing at one, as these guns were also notorious for their inaccuracy, even at relatively close range. Thus, firing two inaccurate weapons at a single target, potentially at more or less the same time, actually significantly increased your chance of hitting it. As for documented accounts of people dual wielding historically, we have many. For example, many pirates seem to not just have resorted to dual wielding for this purpose, but also often carried many more guns on their person when attacking or being attacked, allowing for potentially multiple realms of dual wielding. For example, notorious pirate Edward Teach, aka Blackbeard, seems to have carried as many pistols as he could comfortably put on his person during attacks, allegedly upwards of 6 to 12 at a time. Moving on to the late 18th century, we have this account from a June 16, 1772 letter recounting the attack on the HMS Gatsby. Duddingston, with his two pistols in his hands, jumped up upon deck, went forward, and hailed them. They answered they wanted him, and by God, they would have him dead or alive. He ordered them to keep off their peril. They continued to advance, and he fired his pistols amongst them, which hurt nobody. They returned the fire immediately, shot the captain in the arm, and wounded him in the body, of which it's thought he will die. Another account of dual wielding can be found in a report of the exploits of lawman Bat Masterson, as accounted by one Dr. W.S. Cockrell. W.B. Masterson shot seven men dead within a few minutes. While in a frontier town, news was brought to him that his brother had been killed by a squad of ruffians just across the street. Taking a revolver in each hand, for he shoots readily with both of them, in this manner Dr. Cockrell demonstrated this by crossing his wrists to form an X, he ran over to avenge his brother. The murderers became terror-stricken when they saw him coming and hastily locked the door. Masterson jumped square against the door with both feet, bursting it open at the first attempt. Then he sprang inside, firing immediately right and left. Four dropped dead in a shorter time than it requires to tell it. 
Perhaps the most famous case of dual wielding of all is that of Gold Rush prospector and army veteran Captain Jonathan Davis. On December the 19th, 1854, Davis and his two companions, James McDonald and Dr. Bolivar Sparks, were walking on a trail in El Dorado County, California, when they were ambushed by a large band of outlaws. Said outlaws subsequently downed the good doctor and McDonald, leaving Davis to face 11 bandits alone. Given the number of attackers firing at him simultaneously, he pulled out both of his Colt revolvers at once, stood his ground, and emptied them. When the guns were spent on both sides, there were four remaining bandits, meaning Davis had managed to down seven moving targets with 12 total rounds. Three of the remaining attackers then drew their bowie knives and one reportedly a sword. Davis, who was noted as being an extremely good fencer, drew his own bowie knife, managing to kill the first, disarm the second, lopping off one of his fingers and the guy's nose in the process, and then dispatched the remaining too. When the dust settled, seven of the bandits were dead, and the remaining four would later die of their wounds. McDonald was also dead, but Dr. Sparks was still alive at this point, though he later died of his wounds. As for Davis, he suffered only a few holes in his clothes and some minor flesh wounds from the shots that had barely missed. If you're thinking, maybe given that Davis is the only one who survived, he may have embellished his actions, it's noted that beyond the doctor living for a bit after to recount what happened, a group of miners nearby witnessed the firefight and would later to corroborate Davis's story. Of course, it should be noted that it does seem in the vast majority of cases at this point in history, most people had switched to favoring single wielding of their firearms for the simple reason that they were now using relatively reliable and accurate firearms that could hold multiple rounds, and in most cases, you weren't finding yourself out in the open under the attack of far more assailants than a single pistol could handle. Further, while there is a bit of a time penalty in drawing a second weapon later in single wielded firing, some people are exceptionally fast at it. For example, consider this account of Wild Bill Hickok. He shot six times so quick it startled me, for his six was in his holster when I said draw, I was looking directly at him and only saw a motion and he was firing. No use to ask how he drew, I don't know. I only saw his arm was not straight and stiff. There was a perceptible curve to his arm, but very slight. Every shot was in the paper and two in the spot but all of them within one inch of an up and down line like this. And speaking of ambidextrous shooting, while Hickok apparently did not typically dual wield, as it was almost never necessary at this point, it was apparently prodigiously skilled at ambidextrous shooting, with the account going on, We put up another paper, and Bill tried his left hand, with the result that all were in the paper, but none in the spot, but all of them on the up and down line, six inch. Each almost over the other, or in the same hole. I said, Not quite so good, Bill. He said, I never shot a man with my left hand, except the time when some drunken soldiers had me down on the floor and were trampling me, and then I used both hands. And just as a pro tip for those wanting a big target but slightly lower chance of death than aiming higher up, especially in more modern times with antibiotics and medical facilities and expertise, in this account, Hickok also states, Charlie, I hope you never have to shoot any man, but if you do, shoot him in the guts near the navel. You may not make a fatal shot, but he will get a shock that will paralyze his brain and arm so much that the fight is all over. Of course, modern guns are typically exceptionally accurate, and some hold an amazing number of bullets, further skewing firearms experts against the practice of dual wielding, especially as depicted by Hollywood, where they often fire at multiple targets at once. This is a pretty surefire way for most not to hit anything, though a select few can pull it off. Exhibit A. A man considered by many to be the greatest shooter of all time, competitive shooter, and many world record holder, Jerry Machulek, who has a video you can go watch of him firing two guns at random targets popping up from about seven meters away. He also did the same thing with just one gun for comparison. The results? In the single weapon test, out of 26 shots, 24 found their marks on the randomly popping out targets. In the dual wielding test, 48 of the 52 shots found their mark, meaning he attains the same 92.3% accuracy on both tests, but with one he had twice as many bullets to work with. However, beyond of course being one of the greatest gun wielders in history, it's noteworthy here that he was standing completely still, unlike what is often depicted in movies with the characters running, jumping, flipping, and firing all at the same time. Further, Michulek was only firing one weapon at a time and explicitly noted the extreme difficulty in doing it this way versus single weapon firing, even though in the end his success rate of hitting the targets was the same in both tests. 
And if you're curious, while timing wasn't an explicit thing being measured here, with the random popping out timing particularly potentially affecting results, for what it's worth, we measured and the single gun fire took 36 seconds, or 1.38 seconds per shot, and the dual firing took 1 minute and 16 seconds, or a rate of about 1.46 seconds per shot, which is actually slower. But again, Matulek wasn't trying for speed here, and the timing of the pop-outs wasn't being regulated between the two tests. Rather, each test finished when he'd emptied the guns with, in the case of dual firing, a couple instances of him not able to focus and fire at all before a target popped out and then disappeared. It would be interesting to see him rerun the demonstration, but specifically designing a test to see if he could be faster at hitting random targets with two guns compared to one, or if his ability to adjust targeting with one gun is actually faster than his ability to refocus back and forth between weapons, as may be the case from this demonstration. For another example, this time with timing factored, former Army Special Operations Officer Dave Ryer managed to fire at six targets in 2.81 seconds with dual firing. However, despite both he and the targets being stationary, this resulted in just two solid hits. One mediocre glancing hit, and he missed three of the targets completely. In contrast, when he fired using only a single gun, while it did take almost a second more to fire at all six targets, 3.73 seconds in this case, all but one of the hits was right on target, and the one that wasn't was only barely off. While they concluded from all this dual firing was not effective, in fact, when he dual fired with both guns pointed at a single target, he was able to maintain his accuracy with both weapons, effectively allowing for a doubling of the rate of fire, should he so choose, while also doubling the number of bullets at his disposal without reloading or drawing another weapon. Further, even with his non-optimal technique in the video of more or less stabbing at the target with each shot rather than stabilizing both hands together in front with his only real movement being his trigger fingers, this at least pretty clearly demonstrated dual firing can be useful in some scenarios, similar to historic examples, just not necessarily when trying to fire at multiple targets simultaneously in most cases, with exceptions such as the aforementioned account from Wild Bill Hickok when his attackers were quite literally on top of him. When the attackers are that close, it's hard to miss, and aiming at two people at once can potentially be of benefit and indeed be practical. So this all brings us to the recommended way to dual fire to try and take advantage of the benefits the technique offers while minimizing the potential decrease in accuracy. Royer aside, firearms experts we observed doing this almost universally recommend holding both weapons close together and in front such that your hands are more or less pressed together for added stabilization and ensuring both guns are mostly locked on the same target. You then use one of the gun's sights for targeting and ignore the others. That said, there is a slightly more sophisticated way to do this recommended by the former Soviet counterintelligence agency called Smirsh, with the end goal here to add a tiny bit more stabilization. Founded in 1942 and disbanded in 1946, Smirsh's official duties, beyond making people chuckle over their name, which Stalin came up with as a portmanteau of two Russian words that more or less mean death to spies, involved routing out counter-revolutionaries and eventually attempting to capture Hitler. It is this group who originally found Hitler's body after Hitler bravely and with no regard for his own personal safety managed to infiltrate the Fuhrer bunker and take himself out. Going back to firing two guns at once, Smirsh agents were trained to press their hands together out in front of them, as many other dual shooters recommend, but in addition, they would also wrap their thumbs around each other in a sort of looping X hook for added stability. Noteworthy here is that it's believed that a similar tactic was used by the Soviet NKVD, of whom Smirsh were an offshoot because their standard sidearm, the Nagant M1895, was a revolver that only held seven rounds. Firing in this manner allowed them to fire 14 rounds with only a minor decrease in their overall accuracy, if any. Of course, in all of this, modern weapons with their extreme accuracy, reliability, and often high number of bullets they hold, combined with the absurdly rare cases where one would actually need to double the number of rounds in their hands at a given moment, makes it so seemingly no firearm expert today recommends anyone bother with practicing dual wielding. And certainly the way it's depicted in a film, with the protagonists practically doing a gymnastics routine, sometimes even firing at targets on opposite sides of them simultaneously, is a surefire way for even the world's best shooters to hit absolutely nothing unless the targets are right next to them, or, you know, the size of Mount Everest. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, do check out our fantastic sponsor, Cuisine Royale, linked to below. And thank you for watching.